Fleetwood's long-standing reign as Britain's premier distant water fishing port began its slide into decline in September of 1972 with the onset of the so-called Cod Wars when the Icelandic government declared a unilateral 200 mile economic exclusion zone around their country. By the time the British government finally conceded the zone in 1976 the writing for the town was already well and truly on the wall. The last distant water trawler to use Fleetwood fish dock sailed out back in 1982. This gunboat 4 was instrumental in that demise. After repeatedly harassing Fleetwood trawlers, finally, with political agreement supposedly in the bag, 4 cut the warps of the trawler Carlisle. It was then rammed by HMS Falmouth, which led the Icelanders to man their guns, though no shots were actually exchanged. And this is the actual cutting gear used on the trawler's warps, which I tracked down to the Icelandic fishing town of Akranes in 1993. And while not directly affected by the Icelandic conflict, with the town's economy obviously suffering as a result, it wasn't long before the inshore fleet also began to contract. A marina now occupies the old commercial dock, and the fish dock is all but empty, leaving just a few diehards still tying up at Jubilee Quay. The ripple effect of Fleetwood's declining fishing industry has also had consequences way beyond the boundaries of the town. Even my plans to get involved in some sort of fishery based research project began to look scuppered when the scope, range and sailing frequency of the port's fishing fleet was reduced. That was until a long standing angling friend of mine, Frank B, offered to introduce me to his brother Ben who was still operating the inshore trawler Biddy out of Jubilee Quay at that time. As those who knew Ben will testify, he was not your typical commercial fisherman. Far from it in fact. Always chirpy and forever smiling, the politics of a job never seemed to get him down, or if they did then it never showed. So long as the weather was set fur and he could get in a few tows, Ben was always happy. It didn't seem to matter much that there wasn't a huge pay packet at the end of the day, just being out there was most definitely his life. As an angler, and as a scientist, this was a golden opportunity for me to see just exactly what the Morecambe Bay fishery really did contain, while at the same time looking for a suitable research project to follow up, which I felt certain had to be out there. During the latter half of the 1980s when the archive footage shown here was shot, I did quite a number of trips with Ben and his then crewman Albert Howarth, sometimes fishing for the market when there were edibles to be had and in the spring working the loon slope for flounders to be sold as pot bait when there was nothing else to be caught, which as it would turn out produced two promising lines of research to be followed up. Mixed in amongst the healthier fish in the net was an interesting cross-section of less healthy specimens displaying a wide range of physical deformities, open sores and abnormal growths. You're always going to see a few fish with problems but the diversity and numbers we were seeing here look worthy of closer examination. As an angler I've seen the odd problem fish come up on Ron line but nothing could have prepared me for this. These fish went way beyond anything most anglers are ever likely to see, probably because most were simply too sick to be interested in taking a bait. Research already done into flatfish problems lays much of the blame for this at the door of persistent residues contained within industrial, agricultural and wastewater treatment discharges accumulating in the bottom sediment of estuaries, where flounders in particular are common. 
These chemicals are thought to break down the protective mucus covering these fish, allowing bacteria, viruses and other pathogens to gain entry. Interestingly, at the same time, we were also seeing quite a number of healthy flounders, which Ben and Albert call left-handers. When flatfish fry first hatch, they have round bodies, which eventually start to flatten. At the same time, the eye on what will become the blind side in contact with the seabed migrates across the head to purr over the other, close to the mouth. Flounders, like plaice and dabs, are genetically programmed to lie on the left side of the body. But sometimes this coding gets either misread or copied wrong, resulting in the flattening process not exactly going according to plan. What we were seeing was good numbers of reverse flounders that had gone down on the wrong side, creating, if you like, a mirror image of how things should have been. The first one I saw was a curio, but as more and more appeared, scientific curiosity began to kick in. Why so many? Was the condition heritable? And might a pair of reversed individuals, if they bred, be able to affect the local population? After all, a quick weight to length graph comparison of left and right sided flounders in the same size category suggested that the reverse fish were actually better adapted to the wire estuary at least. Perhaps, at last, I'd finally found the project I'd been looking for. All that was needed then was to get it funded. Meanwhile, other aspects of the catch were also grabbing my attention such as the taking of nearly 30 big brill one afternoon, somewhere along a towing line from Loomboy to South Walney, plus fish like John Dory and Haig, neither of which are ever seen on Rodden Line out in the bay. Before I had a chance to get started on my project, Ben got rid of Biddy under the decommissioning scheme. But it wasn't too long before he was back on the water with a new smaller boat called Scorpio and a new crewman, Doug Alder. I never actually got to sail aboard Scorpio, which in light of what was to happen was probably no bad thing. One flat calm day out towards Lightning Knoll, Ben and Doug got something in the net that was more than the boat could handle. Whether it was rubbish, a boulder, or something lost from a ship is difficult to say. Whatever it was, as the winch struggled to lift the weight of the laden net, Scorpio capsized and sank. Typical of many fishermen, myself included, Ben was no swimmer, so it fell to Doug to keep the purr of them afloat for the ten minutes or so it took to be rescued. Doug was eventually pulled from the water alive. Ben unfortunately failed to make it back. <laughs> 